Who did that? Not me. <laughs> I've, I've decided I'm just going to let it be what it is. Yes. I, All I, I mean, at the pictures up there, and, and you guys, I talk with my hands, so I've done so many webinars where I'm not watching myself, so this will be interesting, but I often talk a lot with my hands, and I'm not Italian. Um, so it, it, when I was looking at all the pictures of United Survivors that you had up on the screen, that was so incredible for me because I know so many of those folks, and I'm just really honored to be here this afternoon. So the title of my um, presentation this evening is The Missing Piece, P-E-A-C-E. And learning how to make meaning of the of the pain from the past. And I had the privilege today. I was in I was in um, Elkton, Maryland, the northeast uh, part of Maryland, and did a day long presentation for people with lived experience as well as providers from the, from a, a vast part of the community. And the the topic of the um, the day was uh, compassion fatigue and self-care and so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of that the same things but I just want you to know I'm a little bit pumped up because I am passionate about this work I absolutely believe that people can heal and that they can regain a life worth living beyond the pain from the past so next slide please Ursula So one of my favorite books, you know, it's one of those books that I can remember passages from and I don't have that great of a memory, but it's from Viktor Frankl's book. It's a little little tiny book when he was first uh, developing Logos Therapy, which is about storytelling. But what he talked about um, in that book is, was written about his experiences um, as a Holocaust survivor, what happened in the concentration camps. And this one phrase, that which is to give light must endure burning. And I think if you're on this call, if you're on this webinar, that you have experienced the pain of the flame. And what I know is from meeting incredible people all over the country, that those of us who have endured the burning have so much light to give. And it's you know, and that giving of the light, the passing of the light from one to another is part of what illuminates our experiences and also is there to illuminate the path of those who come behind us. Next slide, please. So just real briefly, and, and many of you have probably already attended a workshop somewhere. In my work with the National Council, so I've been with the National Council now for oh, a little over eight years, and I've been working with adult trauma survivors for over 30 years. And I am a, I am a suicide attempt survivor, um, quite a number of suicide attempts. And part of the reason I'm so passionate about this work is that it was when I began to look at what happened to me, things began to change. Um, I could not make the correlation. No one, I was one of, you know, I was back there in the early days of when uh, psychiatric hospitals uh, were, people from psychiatric hospitals were released back into the community. I was a kid in one of the first community mental health centers in our little rural town in Eastern North Carolina. And the only thing anybody ever talked to me about, and I was, I experienced depression and suicidal ideation from the time that I was probably 12. My first attempt was at 13. But for a long time, I'm 60 years old now, and for from the time I was 13 until in my late 30s, I lived with suicidal ideation, but something shifted. I never had another attempt after I started looking at the what happened and the questions were, everybody was always asking me what was wrong with me. And when, the, when I finally had someone ask me what happened to me, life really began to change. And then it changed even more greatly when someone asked me, Cheryl, tell me about your gifts, strengths, skills, and talents. So rather than focusing on what was wrong with me, they began to focus on what I had within. So the reason we have to understand why trauma is imperative is it's pervasive. 
you know, when we look, we're going to take a little bit of a look at the ACEs study, and what we know is 59% of the adult population in this country has experienced at least one adverse childhood experience. That doesn't count for anything over the age of 18. And so, so it's a common, one of the things that I, I really appreciate about the trauma conversation, it is a, it's a, it's an equalizer. All of us can be susceptible to trauma. And that doesn't mean that there's something wrong with us because the trauma, we had traumatic, traumatic experiences. Its impact is broad and diverse. Um, some of us heal differently, and I know my southern accent gets in the way, but when I'm saying heal, I'm talking about H-E-A-L, healing. Um, it's broad and diverse. Many of us, we experience it in different ways. The impact is deep and life-shaping. It certainly shaped my life and put me on a trajectory that almost ended my life, and it wasn't until it was addressed that my life began to change. We know that interpersonal violence and transgenerational transmission is self-perpetuating. So when I talk about that, I'm talking about the fact that I had a mother who struggled significantly with depression. And it's, I don't want to get into the genetics and the, um, the, uh, the, what came first, the chicken or the egg. But what I know is that in our family, the women in our family really struggled with depression. And I was the first one of all of those generations that actually that I am aware of and know the people goes back three generations um, of, of someone who's been able to heal. And that it's insidious. It di differentially affects the more vulnerable. So when we talk about when we talk about trauma, and I'll talk briefly about intergenerational trauma and historical trauma. Um, when we look at poverty, bullying, and racism, that's our population. When we talk about people who show up, who are experiencing suicidal ideation, many of us are more vulnerable. So even thinking about the LGBTQ community. It affects how people approach services. And what I mean by that, believe me, when I was 20 years old and had like the worst experience, I had struggled with, I'd had a suicide attempt and I went in and had an experience in a service provider and holy cow, I wouldn't have gone back to, I didn't go back to see anybody for years and years and years, except I continued to struggle. I mean, I would have suicide attempt, and the minute I was out of the hospital, it was like, no way am I going to talk to anybody. Fortunately, through the work that I've been able to do at the National Council and others who have been involved in the world of uh, creating trauma-informed organizations, some of that has begun to, begun to change. We're much more looking at strength-based work where, you know, that's person-centered, that people are driving their own, their own healing and their own, own wellness. And also service systems have often been re-traumatizing. So for me, it is bizarre that I do the work that I do because I was uh, part of the consumer psychiatric survivor movement for many, many years. I still am, but that was like, antithetical for many of us to even talk about service systems and what had you know through a course of events I ended up being someone who was working to change the system and that's the work that I am the most proud of is to really be able to go in and work within systems and within organizations to help them understand that there are things they can do right and there are things that they can do wrong and what I, what I have found in my work all over the country is people who are providing services do not wake up in the morning and go, oh, I think I'm going to re-traumatize somebody today. Intentions are good, but we have to educate them. And that's part of, you know, I'm, I'm so thrilled to be part of, you know, Heidi and Shelby and Ursula and another huge group of us who are working to make a difference. Next slide, please. So when we talk about trauma, we just want to, you know, a brief definition, the three key elements is that it, it is an event or a series of events or set of circumstances experienced by an individual. Everyone experiences trauma as an individual. All of us could go through a hurricane or a flood or a tornado, and every single one of us would have an individual experience of what that event was like. The, the main thing is that it's overwhelming or life-changing, and it has profound effects 
on every part of our being, our, our psychological development, our physiological development. I'll talk a little bit about what it means to have your brain on fire, um, our, our, our social relationships, and certainly an, uh, the, a spiritual impact. Trauma overwhelms a person's capacity to cope. I never attempted suicide when I was like feeling chill and everything was great in my life. It was always when I felt completely overwhelmed by the circumstances in my life. And it very often was a triggering event from some of the trauma I experienced. Next slide, please. So just, just to be clear, there's trauma and all trauma is important and people can experience one event. But when we talk about complex trauma, and I know many, many, many people, I apologize for the sirens in the background. I know many, many people who have experienced complex trauma and that's repetitive, prolonged or cumulative. In other words, it's happening every day or all the time. It's, you know, and it could come from multiple sources. And when we talk about interpersonal direct harm, exploitation and maltreatment, um, very often people experience the, the greatest trauma in their lives by people that are supposed to be our caregivers. So when I talk about my trauma story, my mother was a, a woman who really struggled with her mental health challenges and I was her victim. I was the person that she lashed out to towards the most. And it was not, it, you know, there was no sexual abuse. There was, there was emotional neglect, but it was the, it was her anger towards me as a human being that had such a profound effect on me. And, and I'm grateful that I had the opportunity to heal that relationship before she died. So the main thing to remember about complex trauma is it really happens during childhood or adolescence. Um, and can occur later in life and in conditions of vulnerability associated with disability, disempowerment, dependency, age, or infirmity. So our most vulnerable times, childhood, adolescence, and I would also like to add uh, times, um, times when we are aging. Next slide, please. So trauma shapes our belief. When we talk about it shaping our worldview, um, so, for example, I talked a little bit about my mom. So, for me, in my worldview, it took me until I was in my late 30s to have good, solid relationships with women because all women were bad and all women were out to hurt me. Now, that's not the truth, but that was the worldview that I had. In terms of spirituality, some people go far, really far one way, and they it's like, nope, no God for me. I don't want any part of that. Any God... Any God that could let this happen or allow me to feel this way, nope, not doing that. Or we can go all the way to the other end. And what that, and, and that would be that we have, um, I, mean, I wouldn't call it pronounced spirituality, I would call it pronounced religiosity, where God's going to save me, God's going to do everything for me, and we ignore what's actually really going on. And then finally, our identity. So for me, most of my, until my healing began to happen, tattooed across my forehead, when I looked in the mirror, it was like, I'm bad, I'm wrong, I don't deserve to be here, I am nothing, I am nobody, I should die. So my identity was really based in what a horrible human being I was and that my life was not worth living. Next slide, please. So, I love Brene Brown. If you haven't read her book, Braving the Wilderness, please get it. It's amazing. Um, and I, I just heard her speak at our conference. She just, she just pins the knee, she <laughs> pins the tail on the donkey every time. So what she talks about, shame is the intensely painful feeling or experience of believing that we are flawed and therefore unworthy of love and belonging, something we've experienced done or failed to do makes us unworthy of connection. And in my world, the antidote or the antithesis of suicidality for me and the depression and the despair that I experienced 
has been the connections that I have made with other people. So whether it was through my work, whether it was through healing my relationships, or whether it was, you know, regardless of what it was, it's always looking for connection. And that longing for connection is within each one of us. Next slide, please. So trauma results in a vicious loop. So in my family, the vicious loop uh, was passed generation by generation. In some people, we can think of, um, you, know, you may have had the girlfriend, I've been the girlfriend or the boyfriend who has gone out and chosen the same person over and over and over again. Uh, I hear this whenever I work with people who um, people who are working in the domestic violence or sexual assault world is when people go out and without any there's no there's no understanding of the construct of how we choose that same person over and over again, but that's another vicious loop the other the final vicious loop that I think about is that we pass this on to our children, and so it becomes intergenerational as it did in my family. Next slide. So we have to have a paradigm shift. We have to begin looking in the other water. So we ask, we have to we ask, have to ask what happened to the person rather than what's wrong with them. And it, that is that is so not helpful. What's wrong with you? You know, and I, I have had people ask me that. What's wrong with you? Why can't you get your act together? You have so much potential. We have to really start asking what's strong rather than what's wrong. We really have to start looking at what are the tools, what are the resources that a person, what, what are the internal resources and the external resources that we have that can begin to shift our thinking about who we are or who, who the people we're working with. There's work by Edith, Dr. Edith Brotberg. She worked, her work was all around children and building resilience. Excuse me. And there's three statements of resilience that I, I just love that, you know, that everybody should have, you know, tattooed on their heart or on their mirror in the bathroom or on the refrigerator in the kitchen is a call to arms to what do I have? What are the things that I have access to that are going to move me forward to a life of healing? What, who, who am I? Who am I really? Am I really a person that's bad? Or am I a person who, you know, I've survived a lot. I am someone who is strong. I am someone who's kind and compassionate to other people. And I'm a daggone hard worker. So recognizing who I am as a human being. And then finally, what can I do? I can reach out to other people who support me and love me unconditionally. I can get my, I can find a way to get education about any of the things that I have questions about. I can, I can be a supporter for other people. So, and, so it's, I have, I am, and I can. Next slide, please. So some of you, I, you know, I wish I could see the audience. Um, so many of you may know about the Adverse Childhood Experiences Study. If you don't, just very briefly, it um, came out of Kaiser Permanente is where it started with the work of Dr. Vince Politti, who was an internist in an obesity clinic. And he was having great success with this particular diet that he was using for people. They would lose massive amounts of weight, 250, 300 pounds. And once the weight loss had happened, they gained it right back, sometimes even faster than, 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 they, um, than they lost it. And so he began asking people, what is going on? What happened to you? And he had two sisters that was in his, that was in his clinic that changed everything for him. And that both of the sisters had been sexually abused as a child. And one of them spoke up and said, I lost the weight, I felt attractive, I got in a relationship, and when I got engaged, the idea of intimacy absolutely terrified me, and I began to eat for comfort and for protection. So that led him to start asking questions to all kinds of people, people who were struggling with smoking cessation, people who were struggling with diabetes control, people who had COPD. Over a 10-year period, they, the, the, the study was, give, was done with over 17,000 people. It's now been done with many millions of people, and the results are the same. 
the, the study looked at the effects of child adverse childhood experiences. Now, and again, this is just childhood up to the age of 18. Largest study that's ever been done on the subject, and it's the most impactful epidemiological study that has ever been done on um, health care across uh, ad, um, phys mental, physical, mm -hmm. social, and spiritual aspects of a person over the course of a lifespan into adulthood. Next slide, please, Ursula. So what happens, a person, we're born, we're conceived, and let it be known, there can be adverse experiences in utero if a baby is in danger if the mother is being threatened um, we know that in utero people are based in the hormones and the emotions of the mother we're born and then stuff happens to us so there are the child adverse childhood experiences in this particular study there are 10 questions that are asked and you can google it it's um i would go to www.aces connection no www.aces2 that's t o o high dot org Heidi did you get that okay www.aces2 t o t o o high dot org so what happens we have these experiences you know in these ten categories that do not include all the kinds of trauma that a person can experience they're kind of clumped in child abuse neglect um, uh, 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 dysfunction in the home and um, the absence of a parent uh, from the home. So what happens, we have the experiences and that causes disrupted neurodevelopment. In other words, that's where the brain starts coming. It, we're coming online very early in childhood, as, as I was saying, the, the key times are child, early childhood and adolescence. And I'm not going to go too far into the brain development piece, but it it changes the trajectory of how we think and how we feel and what we do, which leads us to have social, emotional, and cognitive impairment that we don't function, at, you know, if we live in a perfect, not a perfect, but a home that is healthy and happy and people are supported and there's enough food to eat and there's a roof over our head and we basically love each other. We're going to grow up pretty well. Not everybody has that experience. Then what happens, and this was very much my story, so there was all of the impairment, and I adopted health risk behaviors. I struggled with cigarette smoking most of my adult life. Thank God I'm not smoking anymore. Um, you know, addiction issues, uh, um, high-risk sexual behavior, you name it, I, I was one of those people who drove fast and hoped I had a wreck uh, and didn't kill anybody else. And then we know that people with mental health challenges um, succumb to disease, disability, and social problems, and we die 25 years early. So that's the ACE study in a nutshell. Next slide, please. This is what they found. Of those early 17,000 respondents, one in four was exposed to two categories of ACEs, one in 16 was exposed to four, 22% of the people that they talked to were sexually abused as children, and, and I mean, that, that's mind-boggling to me. 66% of the women experienced abuse, violence, or family strife in childhood. And women were 50% more likely than men to have experienced five or more ACEs. That doesn't mean that men did not have ACEs. It just means that the likelihood of a woman being perpetrated against in early childhood was much higher. Next slide. So, so this, this was one of the things, and this is, you know, it's like any suicide conference I go to, any work that I do, this has to be talked about. We are not going to make a difference in suicide prevention if we don't talk about trauma and the correlation between trauma and suicidality. So if a person has no ACEs of those 10 categories, only 1% 1 1 of 100 people will attempt suicide. If a person has three ACEs, 10% of those people will attempt suicide. If a person has an ACE score of seven, 20% of people will attempt suicide. I have an ACE score of six. 
do you think this made sense to me when I finally saw it? It's like, holy cow, we have to look at the what happened to folks. Next slide, please. So same thing with depression, and this is called the dose relationship response. So zero ACEs, it's much lower around depression. Uh, greater than four, um, you'll, you'll see a much, much higher score with a lifetime history of depression. Next slide. It goes straight up. Next slide, please. Okay, we're having some technical difficulties here. <laughs> so this is just looking at the lifelong physical, mental, and behavioral health outcomes that are linked to ACEs, and I'm not gonna read off all of these, but what's important to recognize is ACEs are, is, are, ACEs are not the cause of these things. They are correlated to these things. So ACEs don't cause lung cancer. ACEs don't cause obesity. But in the example of the, the women that were talking, you know, talking about their sexual abuse with Dr. Folletti, what they say is, I mean, the obesity was not caused by the trauma, but it led to, it correlated with why they had uh, extreme weight gain. So looking at alcohol, tobacco, and other drug addictions, I have met so few people in the addictions world that have not had experiences of trauma. When we look at things like diabetes, it's not just the way we eat. It is the toxic stress that we live under. Um, you know, if you look at self-regulation and anger management problems, none of that comes from the ACEs. It comes from the impact of the toxic stress that causes us to lash out. Next slide, please. So this is what I'm talking about. What happens to trauma survivors? We end up with a dysregulated nervous system. As I said, when I was when in the throes of the worst part of my life, it felt like my brain was on fire. I could not weave through what I was experiencing in my brain to make good decisions or figure out ways to heal. And if it's unaddressed, we find ourselves in social environments that cannot contain this dysregulation. So one of the things in a trauma-informed care world is we end up in service systems that don't know how to address the dysregulation. They can't contain that. And we end up in places where people are not coming from a place of kindness, compassion, dignity, and respect. Next slide. The way I describe what, you know, what used to happen to me is with a dysregulated nervous system, so you think of a car and the RPMs, those of us with a dysregulated nervous, nervous system often idle at a much higher rate than others. So if you're idling at 60 and something happens, this would be me, something happens, I would go all the way to 160. And there was no time in there to even think through what had happened. I just automatically went to that other place. And that place is dysregulated and it caused poor decision making. It's the impulse of taking a person of a person taking their life by suicide. Something happens, there's a consideration for suicide, and then we go to the 160. Next slide, please. So it's often Trauma is often overlooked because behavioral responses resemble common delinquent behaviors, this is in kids, and are under-identified as trauma symptoms. So people, you know, I, I always, <laughs> so people will, will come in and they will have great difficulty with their social relationships. And, the, and somebody may, you know, they may fi follow the symptomology of somebody with, with, with a diagnosis of borderline personality di disorder or oppositional defiant disorder or ADHD. And I'm not saying any of those, those things don't exist, but I have never, ever met anyone with borderline personality disorder that did not have significant trauma in their lives. And if you look at the work of Dr. Marsha Linehan, she will totally support that. And she uh, developed uh, dialectical behavioral therapy for people. It started out with people um, with borderline personality disorder, and now it's really used very much 
as learning new coping skills for um, tra trauma manifestation. And it can look different. So a child who is actually depressed shows up um, in rage. So if we look at all of the young white males that, um, you know, that the, the school shooting, that population, you will find trauma in their background. Um, and many people just don't connect the symptoms to trauma. So that's part of our work is to make sure that we're asking the right questions. And in treatment settings, we have many treatment settings that still are very punishment oriented rather than help or support or focusing on the person's strength. Next slide, please. So, and click again, please, Ursula. So, thinking of a brain on fire, if you're under, if, if some, wherever you're sitting right now out there in the world and somebody burst into your room and God forbid that happened, you would not be able to think of anything at, except surviving. And, and when a person is living under um, toxic stress from trauma, there's an inability to respond, to learn or process. I can remember coming out of a hospital and being given a treatment plan and being told what my treatment plan was and getting home and going, what, what is this? What, I don't know what this is. So we really have to work with people to try and, you know, to help, help people come to a place where they're much more mindful and much more able to self-regulate using a lot of mindfulness, mindfulness and wellness techniques. Next slide, please. So I, <laughs> I did this whole presentation today and I talked a lot about the things that make me happy. And cortisol to me is, cortisol is, is an, an oxytocin, so oxytocin, cortisol is the stress hormone. And if we have too much, and it goes unaddressed, if we have too much toxic stress in our life, it is gonna impact, it impacts the brain, which actually causes some of those health, health problems that we talk about. So cortisol release, if you have been through a traumatic event, cortisol release continues after the stressor has been removed. Too much cortisol has a significant impact on health. So if you know somebody who has experienced a traumatic event, and we learn a lot of this after things like 9-11, the faster we can intervene or support a person after a traumatic event, to bring the brain back online to where it needs to be, the better we're gonna do. Next slide, please. So, this is my favorite hormone, oxytocin. It's the love hormone, it's the bonding hormone. Everybody has the ability to experience, you know, what happens with oxytocin. So when I get back to my house tomorrow, I'm going to walk in. I have a 14-year-old miniature schnauzer who is deaf. And if I walk in and he actually hears me come in the door, he is going to agree. He actually, he actually acts like he's four when I walk in the door. That little dog has given me more oxytocin when I come home from a trip because he just loves me. He he he. I am the queen of the world to him. He's one little way that I recognize that I get oxytocin. Um, I'm a gardener, and I finally have enough space. I've always planted something somewhere, but I'm a gardener. And um, those who follow me on Facebook, I post pictures of my garden frequently. I will walk out in my garden. I just planted roses in a rose garden a couple of weeks ago. And I'll walk out there, and I'll go, so pretty, so pretty. That's, I can feel the oxytocin flood in my bones. When I am with my granddaughters, I have three little, three beautiful granddaughters, a nine-year-old and twin, uh, and twin girls. And when I am with them, I can feel it. I mean, it's, I mean, love is in the air. So it's not just, you know, we release it after sex. We release it when we're breastfeeding. We release it during uh, labor. Um, and men have it too during sex. And it's, and when you want to cuddle with somebody, go for it because you are what you're doing is you are the, giving yourself the antithesis of cortisol. So love big. Next slide. This is from the work of Dr. Bruce Perry, and 
there should um th that should keep going ursula i'm not sure if we've got a slow connection or not there we go so dr perry works with children uh, one of the names of the books that i particularly love was the boy who was raised as a dog it's stories of children who've, who've experienced trauma and how he has worked with them and so what he talks about are these six r's so doing things that are rhythmic if you're out there and you love to rock that is rhythmic. If you love to knit or crochet, that is rhythmic. If you like to play basketball or play tennis, it's something that's rhythmic. If you drum, if you, I, I, my son actually is part of a huge drumming circle in Nashville, and he says when he he says when he leaves that drumming circle, he feels like he's high, even though he's not. Um, we talk about things that are repetitive, and many of those things that are rhythmic are also repetitive, but doing something over and over is calming to the lower brain, which is where trauma impacts the most. Do, doing things that are relational, doing something with someone, so if you're a person who are providing services, do something with them. Don't do it for them. You know, I, I'm, I'm always telling providers, don't sit in your office and do therapy. Get out and take a walk with somebody. If you're doing peer support, go get a cup of coffee. It is not just about sitting and talking. Do things that are relevant. So I don't do art groups. So Shelby Rowe is the artist on this on this um, webinar in the background. Um, you put me in an art group and I'm going to throw a tantrum. But you put me in the journaling group where I'm working with words, I'm all set. Do things that are meaningful to the person rather than forcing them to do something that's not. Doing things that are rewarding for yourself and rewarding not by, oh, I'm going to get a big raise for this or I get the gold star or I'm the best person at this. The reward is an internal reward of I'm so proud of myself. I mean, that, not the one that comes up for me, it, I, I was told that I was too fragile to go to school. And the day I walked across my um, stage picking up my master's degree in social work was one of the most rewarding things I've ever done. I did not do it for anyone else. I did it for Cheryl. And every interaction that we have with a person that we're trying to support has to be respectful. It has to be kind. We treat people like we want to be treated. Sometimes people can't do that in return, but we do it anyway. So that those those six things are ways that we can impact our own lower brain and think about our own wellness. Next slide. So these are just, you know, so there's the crocheting, doing things like hula hoop. These are things with kids. Playing music, uh, pogo stick, um, th this woman rocking in a rocking chair. I often tell the story about how much I love the uh, Charlotte Airport. You walk through and every single terminal is lined with rocking chairs. And if you think about it, so if you can imagine that I'm walking across the floor, the first time we are ever rocked is in utero, in utero when the mother is walking. So that is automatically going to the most, the, the, the lowest part of our brain, and it soothes us. Next slide, please. Touch is so important. So my little dog, I get that touch there. I, I get regular massage. Um, even if you can't afford regular massage, find a buddy and give, your, give each other hand massage, feet massage, shoulder rubs, just being, a, being able to be in your body and to allow that relaxation. Doing things with your hands, the finger, the finger painting in the art class will work for me because I did, it does not have an agenda. Using, um, using things that are, uh, that are sensory, uh, related, any kind of thing that you can get touch in is really important. Next slide. So I want to talk just a little bit. We've got a little bit more time. Um, Dr. Kristen Neff, she has a website called selfcompassion.org, and I, I fell onto this a while back. I have no idea what I was searching for, and it was actually even before I started doing trauma work out on the road. Um, it may have been on my, you know, me looking for how to find compassion for myself. But what she talks about is compassion presupposes the recognition and clear seeing of suffering or to suffer with. 
So when we are with, and Brene Brown again has a beautiful little quick um, YouTube video on empathy about, you know, what it feels like to be with someone. And when we talk about self-compassion, it's learning how to be with ourselves, to come, to come to who we are with our arms outstretched and to love ourselves and to honor our suffering. And compassion is the desire to ameliorate suffering naturally. You know, I don't want to to suffer anymore. I've suffered enough. Believe me, I'm done with it. And she also talks about it requires common humanity. And I don't know how many folks out there are are, uh, attempt survivors, but so many of us, when we are in those darkest times, feel like no one else could possibly know what this is like that we are on our, we are by ourselves and there is no one who could understand. And when we practice self-compassion, we recognize that everybody struggles, that everybody has challenges. We're being challenged, but we are part of the human race. Self-compassion is compassion turned inward. What, there are a lot of us that are really good at taking care of everybody else, but we really have a hard time doing that for ourselves. And one of the things that I love so much about this, because I've, I've done a lot of work on myself and with people that I've, uh, I've supported, there, there are really two things in the world. There is love and then there is darkness. I mean, hate, hate can only exist where caring has actually occurred. But there's love and there is darkness. And self-compassion arises out of love where self-criticism arises out of fear. When we're talking nasty to ourselves, I mean, I'll catch, I still catch myself sometimes going, it's like, girl, did you just say that to yourself? You can't talk to yourself that way. I really want to be a part of loving myself and accepting myself where I am, and self-criticism really has no place in my life at this time. And I love it when people call, it on, call me on it, because I'll say those things. Next slide. So these are just some phrases. Let's see, do do we go forward? Okay, this is fine. So there are three components of self-compassion, self-kindness, that we are going to treat ourselves well, that we are going to treat ourselves just as well as anyone that we are in relationship with, that we are going to recognize that sense of common humanity, and that we are going to practice mindfulness, that we are going to be looking internally, we are going to be reflecting on Am I being loving to myself? I can be loving to other people, but I also need to be included in that equation. When we don't include ourselves in that equation, it is the ultimate act of ego. It is the ultimate act of ego. We are a human being too, and whatever your spiritual belief is, God loves everybody, God created everybody, however you believe, it's that I'm a, I'm a child of God, too. I am a creature of the universe. I was born for the goodness that, that, that has been created. Next slide, please. So these are just a couple of self-compassion phrases. I use these frequently with myself when I'm hurting. You know, I, I will, I'm good at reaching out, but there are times when I really just need to be there for myself. And recognize this is a time of suffering. This is I am having a hard time here. Suffering is a part of life. None of us get through this. It is not a picnic. It's not a cakewalk. Suffering is a part of life. This is a moment of suffering. May I be kind to myself? Just simply be kind. May I give myself a break? May I give myself the compassion that I need? I can do that for myself. And I want it from other people. But I can give that to myself. So practice self-compassion. Next slide, please. What it's not, it's not self-pity. It is not feeling sorry for myself. It is not self-indulgence. So I will indulge myself in sleeping very late on Thursday and laying around in bed and reading my book. But that is an act of self-compassion for me. I've worked hard this week and I I deserve that. I deserve to give myself that little bit of a break. Self-compassion is not self-esteem. It is not like, oh, yeah, I'm good. I've got it. I'm doing it. It very much is like just honoring the me that I am 
and the me that I see in every other person. Next slide, please. So just thinking about principles of a trauma-informed approach, and, and Ursula, I'm aware of my time. I'm going to try and get through this a little, a little quickly. These are, we used to have just five principles, and we've evolved over time. So recognizing that safety has to come first for people, you have to be able to feel safe in order to do anything. Your brain has to be, has to calm down enough to feel safe so you can begin to process, respond, and learn. We, in our relationships, we need to have trustworthiness and transparency, doing what we say. People need to do what they're good, they say they're going to do, and then if they don't, they, they come back and they, they practice honesty. Looking at things from a place of collaboration and mutuality, I am not the expert on anyone. Everybody is the expert on themselves. But how do we collaborate and how do we build a mutual relationship where both of us feel supported? How do we think about empowerment, voice, and choice? Again, I'm the expert on me. I need to be thinking about what are my choices and what are the cho other choices that people need to make? Where does peer support come in? I can tell you that I would not be alive today had I not learned how to be a peer supporter and also to have experienced peer support. When this webinar is over, I have a friend who's meeting me here in Baltimore who is one of my best peer supporters from when I lived in Annapolis, and we're going to go out and we're going to get down with peer support. And then thinking about cultural responsiveness, really considering how cultural culture plays a part in how a person responds to treatment, how they respond to care, and how they respond in relationships. Next slide, please. So this is important when you're thinking about trauma-informed approaches. We, I come from these four different aspects, and it's always from what hurts someone and what helps, or what hurts in an organization and what helps. It's the importance of relationships, what hurts in the relationship and what helps the relationship. I do an activity with folks where we really name those things and people get very creative in what they're thinking. It's the importance of the physical environment. How do we create physical sanctuary for people wherever we go? If you're an organization, if you, you know, if you supervise staff, think about how you create sanctuary. It's the way it looks, smells, uh, what you hear, you know, what's the lighting like, what are the paint colors, is it clean and neat and tidy, does the person want to be there? Thinking about the importance of our attitudes and beliefs, and this comes, so as a, uh, a suicide attempt survivor, I have been the person that they have said, oh, she's a frequent flyer. That is not helpful. Or, oh, that person is borderline personality disorder, and that that's all they're ever going to be. Or, you know, or that person, whatever. It's, you know, when we have attitudes and beliefs about people, we need to get rid of them because the potential possibility for healing and, and, and wholeness is there within every person. And then within organizations, there is a thing called moral safety, and it is the moral responsibility of every organization that's a human service um, organization to think about policies and procedures and how they impact people served and how they impact staff. Next slide. So when we talk about post-traumatic growth, this is an example of Kintsu Kuroi. And in, um, in Japan, when pottery is broken, it will often be put back together. You see the threads of gold, and it is much more beautiful than the original bowl. So post-traumatic growth is the benefit of finding positive psychological change experienced as a result of adversity and other challenges in order to rise to a higher level of functioning. And I know with my colleagues that um, are doing this webinar with me, Shelby and Ursula and Heidi, that they are people who have found post-traumatic growth in some way and are making a difference in the world. And I know that that's very true for me, of trying to find a way to bring my, bring my best self and what I've learned to make a difference in the world. Next slide. So I I'm, I'm, think I'm really getting to be about out of, out of time. Um, 
I do want to, you know, so building resilience, it's about the ability to adapt well to stress, you know, adversity, trauma, or tragedy. If you ever email me, what you will see on my signature line is this. Peace. It does not mean to be in a place where there is no noise, trouble, or hard work. It means to be in the midst of these and still be calm in your heart. That is what resilience means to me, that whatever I go through, I have the ability to respond from a loving place, from a loving for myself and for others, and that I can be, I lost my husband a couple of years ago, and this quote, took me through four years of his illness and through the beginning stages of, of grief and all of the changes and transitions I had to go through. And if you'd asked me 15 years ago if I could have survived that, I would have said no. But resilience is optional. Next slide. So I'm a sailor and I love this quote. And this is very much about me. She stood in the storm, and when the wind did not blow her away, she adjusted her sails. And that is my story, and I'm sticking to it, because my sails have had to be adjusted so many times. Next slide, please. So just a couple of um, uh, resources. Intentional peer support, uh, if you have not heard of IPS, um, if you can bring it to your com community, you can look up intentional peer support online. It, it has been a phenomenal way for me to learn how to be with people. Next slide. And then here are just a couple of others. So I'm, I'm on the board of directors for the Copeland Center for, um, for Wellness and Recovery. And RAP and RAP for Healing for Trauma was a tremendous, it, it was the place it was the process that I learned to take care of myself long before, taking myself long before I ever had a suicidal thought and being able to stay well on the journey. Seeking safety is a good resource that can be used in, um, it, it, peers can deliver seeking safety. That's available online and is downloadable. There is TRIM, Trauma Recovery Empowerment Model, that now has been released to be done by peers with additional training. And then I, I provide a curriculum called Training Trauma-Informed Peers through the National Council. It's called TTIPS, and it's a um, two- to three-day training, depending on, uh, on the group, that really talks about, really gets into the meat of trauma and then how we use our stories to make a difference and then how we use, how we use ourselves as role models and then how we collectively work together as peers. And I think that's my last slide, Ursula, and I'm happy to open it up for questions. That was a yeah. lot of talking in That hour. was fantastic. Oh, well, I think what's so perfect about the questions that you ask is that they were self-reflective. And I think people have thought about some of these questions, but your talk and the information you gave, gave all of us, including myself, a chance to reflect on those again. Uh, the thing about your footer, I think many of us have seen your, your email footer before and it really resonates. So if you know what to expect, you know that this is this makes sense. It makes it more manageable instead of it, you know, needing to be gone. Um, here's Cheryl's contact information, um, Cheryl Sharp 1203 at gmail.com. And yep. um, and then also just want to let you know, we were tweeting along and there's some great quotes. So we want to make sure you that are following your that you follow us um, on Twitter at Unite Survivors. If you don't have a Twitter account, it's a great way to stay connected to the community. And you can Google how to have a Twitter account. And then we also have a great Facebook page. So please follow us there. So our, um, our uh, brave uh, board chair, Sally Spencer Thomas, was tweeting from an airplane and listening along today. Um, <laughs> <laughs> we want to announce our next webinar. We're really excited for Men's Mental Health Month to have Brat. Brett Zach Zachman, which is a great name, uh, for the Be Men organization. So on the 12th of June, um, he'll be speaking about men's wellness post-divorce. So we know that men are at heightened risk after divorce. So again, we thank everybody for joining us. It's been fantastic, Cheryl. We appreciate you. And we look forward to having this posted online because I know people are going to find this resource quite helpful. Thank you so much, Ursula. Thank you, Heidi. Thank you, Shelby. And thank you, audience, for being willing to listen. And um, I look forward to seeing you on the virtual world. You can find me at Cheryl Sharp on Facebook. 
and I live in Newburgh, North Carolina, or Annapolis, Maryland. I'm not sure what's up there right now. Great. Thanks, everybody. We'll see you next time. Take care. Okay.